Don't get caught in the mosh pit Fuel to the fire, ain't nobody can stop it it's Trouble in my city, but you know I'm across it Got a 40 on my hip and I'm liable to spark it Throw down these hits, my click is indivisible I aim, you duck, I squeeze, now you invisible I'm not afraid of getting physical All these different chemicals are fogging up my visuals Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Yo, we notorious, we ain't no runners Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Yo, we some warriors, they ain't caught gunners Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Put on my strap, put on the beat, put on the map, put on my team Take out every motherfucker in between, know what I mean? Better myself, better my aim, better my breath, better my name Killing rappers on my hang, I'm about to change for the fame Never thought I would it, now I'm running You don't wanna follow me, now I'm fucking fucking What's going on? What's going on? Good evening and happy Monday to you guys. Thank you for joining another broadcast of Steve the Kidney Nurse. I am your host, Steve Belcher. Man, how was you guys' weekend? I tell you, yesterday, I definitely had a, a, a busy Sunday. I mean, yesterday was the start of East Africa. I'm sorry, uh, Kidney Hub East Africa with myself and uh, the Kidney Ambassador, uh, Moses Kennedy. And I thought that was a great uh, first show. Please check us out for our other show every Sunday at 12 p.m. USA time and 8 p.m. East Africa time. And then I had a support group Zoom for about an hour with kindness for kidneys. If you're on dialysis and you're looking for a support group for yourself, if you're a caregiver or if you're a patient and you just got newly diagnosed and you're looking for a good support group and you don't have to leave out your house, check out Kindness for Kidneys. All right? Kindness for Kidneys. 
a nice small um, kidney disease support group for caregivers, professionals, um, patients, anyone who wants to come and learn about kidney dialysis or even talk because they have a different topic each um, time they meet. I think they meet twice a month. So again, check them out if you're looking for a great online kidney, kidney disease support group, Kindness for Kidneys. And then I had a Toastmasters at 7 o'clock. I did a Toastmasters uh, speech. Uh, first one I ever did. They said I did pretty well, so I still know I got a long way to go. But tonight, what I wanted to talk about, and it's not going to be long. It's not going to be a long uh, drawing out live tonight because I have to work in the morning. But tonight, what I wanted to touch on, which a lot of kidney warriors have experienced but don't really know about. And I, I've talked about this top, topic many times, but there's never enough times not to talk about this type of topic, complications of hemodialysis, because it's real. It's so real that in your consent form that you sign, given permission to do the treatment, it says it in there. It has to tell you the possible complications that can derive from doing hemodialysis. And so, excuse me, with that being said, as I always mention, you got patients every day, every day being diagnosed with kidney failure. And I know, or I believe my message is getting out there, but it should be tons of people on this live that's dealing with kidney failure. You know, and it's okay that it's four people watching between a mixture of Facebook and YouTube or either or. There's more than 400,000 people that's undergoing kidney dialysis treatment right now. Yeah, we know some people are asleep, some people are doing this, some people are doing that. But I guarantee you got a lot of people online. And that's okay. But if you were dealing with going to outpatient hemodialysis or any kind of kidney dialysis therapy, wouldn't you want to know if you were in an outpatient facility and you got a type of personality, you want to make sure everything is right. You want to make sure everything is right. You don't need nothing to chance. And there's a possibility that air could get in your blood. Wouldn't, wouldn't you want to know that? I would, because there's serious complications if that air gets to you. And you might be saying, Steve, I, I be on dialysis all the time. How, how can air get to me? They be hooking me up all the time. It ain't nothing happening. So how's air going to get to me? Well, it doesn't always have to come from hooking you up, but let's, let's look at some of the causes that present a problem like air and bloodlines. You can have an inadequate blood flow rate. What I mean by that? 
Well, if you want dialysis, you know what I mean. If you have an arterial needle and the technicians or nurses have issues sticking it, and you know because they keep coming back, pulling back on the needle or trying to readjust it, and they say it's going negative. Or even with the catheter. The same applies with a catheter. And so the arterial, this is the venous, but just think, the arterial line has a chamber too. The arterial has a chamber too. And that's where the blood comes out and goes through the arterial. We call it pre-pump. So if, if you're not getting a good flow, whether it's a catheter or your arterial needle, that level can drop. And that, that, that indicates that we're not getting a good blood flow. And if that level drops now, air, you don't have any more blood in here. You just have air. That's why they have a, a, a line up here where they want the technicians, when they prime the machine to fill up, it says it's on the, on the manufacturing package. That's why they got the indentation right here, this line. Because they want the fluid filled up to right there. Anytime you get down to here, you're putting the patient at risk for getting air in the line. It goes to the dialyzer, and it goes through, and it goes through the filter, and it ends up in the venous chamber. This right here. And next thing you know, you see on the uh, machine, we got the air detector alarm that this piece sits in. And each time that it detects air or those micro bubbles, it sets the machine off and it clamps it and it stops the pump. Now it puts you at risk for clotting. How else can air get in there from that? Inadequate connection. Maybe somebody rushing and they hooking up the, the the administration set and they don't twist it tight and they leave it open and some air seep in and get in the lines. It could be any many ways. But the way as a patient you can tell, and I'm telling you right now, if you're watching and you're on dialysis, or if you're a caregiver and you're um the person that you care for maybe sleep or, or doing something else and you watching, the way you can tell if you have air in your machine is look over at the venous, this, this venous chamber, right? That's the blood coming back through you. And see if you see any bubbles. If you see bubbles, and I mean a lot of bubbles, and alarm going off, and the technician keeps coming over there, and you keep seeing, you look over there, you see bubbles, and they keep pressing the alarm, that's air in the blood. And you want to make sure you have someone who knows how to get that air out, because if they don't, if they don't, you could be in a world of trouble. And I'm not trying to scare you, but what I'm saying is a lot of times you got uh, caregivers that don't know what they're doing to get the air out the dialyzer and end up creating or putting more air in it. And the next thing you know, they're throwing your blood away. So you got to be on the lookout for that. This is something that normally happens, but it can. And what they're supposed to do, if they get a lot of air in, in there, they're supposed to take you off, connect the system, and get that air out. 
and then resume the treatment. But if they do that, make sure they put the machine on pause. Because if they keep it running, the machine is running like you're having a treatment, but you're sitting in a chair not. See, a lot of caregivers forget to hit that pause button, especially when you go to the bathroom. They leave it running, so when you come back, it, you, it makes it look like you were still on the machine. So you will come off the same time instead of giving you that 15 or how much time you spent in the bathroom. And then when you go to the scale, you want to know why you didn't take off the fluid, but the machine said it, but you didn't actually take a lot of it at all because you was in the bathroom and they didn't put it on pause so it can stop the fluid removal. So one problem is air in the blood. And that can, again, that can happen. The, the saline bag, which is this right here, could run dry. A, a, a loose line connection. Your access may be not working. So it's not getting the flow. It doesn't matter if you got a catheter. They have it happens to catheters too. Another problem is air embolism. That's different than air in the blood. Okay, let's make no mistakes about that. Both of them serious, but air embolism. Is air bubbles carried by the bloodstream into a vessel small enough to be blocked by the air bubbles? Now, let me repeat that. Air embolism, which is another problem or complication of hemodialysis, is air bubbles carried by the bloodstream into a vessel small enough to be blocked by the air bubbles. Now, what are some of the causes? And see, again, this is not like when patients come in, we sit down and tell them about this. You could be watching this right now on TikTok, or Facebook or YouTube and a patient, and you're like, damn, Steve, this is the first time I ever heard about some air in the blood or air embolism. And that's just two of many. Because you're not going to hear about that. Because the stuff that I'm teaching is for employees, people who are going to learn, who are training to be dialysis caregivers. So they know how to spot these problems and how to intervene or get the proper treatment. I'm giving it to you direct. As they say, with no chase. So let's look at other ways that you as a patient and outpatient hemodialysis could get an air embolism or your parents or your loved ones. Let's look at how it can happen to them. Even though it hasn't happened, it's not like it can't. You ever heard the phrase, to air is human? ERR -R to air is human. So here's some of the causes. And when you got new people in there or a, a clinic that's always short, these are where these problems rear their ugly head. This is when they're most likely to happen when you're running short. 
You got somebody calling out because somebody called out the day prior. So I'm getting them back. I'm calling out. It ain't nothing wrong with them. Or you may have some people that legitimately sick or got issues. You know, take care of their uh, child care, whatever. But when you have a shortage of staff and you got other people picking up extra work or you have inadequate or unexperienced staff trying to do this work because you're short, these are where these problems are most likely to happen. But they can happen anytime. That's why when we go to work, you got to be laser focused. There's no gray area with this. So air embolism, some of the causes are unarmed or defective air detector. That's on the machine. What if the technician forgets to arm the air detector? non occluding defective venous bloodline clamp. What in case it goes, air gets in it and it goes down and the air detector doesn't work? It's a machine. Now you're getting air, the next thing you know, you're wondering why you're getting ready to pass out. And if that happens, you want to make sure the people that's caring for you know how to intervene. They may not even know. Then you have failure to place venous line behind venous line clamp. All right, they may forget to put the line in the clamp. This is not me saying this. This is the main company that does training. And why would they say um, another care, uh, cause would be careless administration of IV fluid medication or failure to place venous line behind venous line clamp because they know it can happen. Careless administration of IV fluids medication. Careless administration. Who's going to be careless? The caregiver. Not you. Empty IV bag or medication bag. How did the bag get empty in the first place? Somebody wasn't watching it. Air and bloodlines or loose connections. Pre-pump, pre-blood pump, air leak in the blood tubing or at any connection in the uh, dialysis system. Separation of bloodlines. Very cold dialysate contain a large amount of dissolved air that, it, that is released when warm. These are all the causes that I just read out that can cause a person on dialysis to have an air embolism. And so you say, Steve, oh shit, man, what are the signs of it? Because if that happens, I want to make sure I'm not experiencing air embolism. Well, I'm glad you asked. Signs and symptoms of an air embolism includes Large volume of air in the venous line. Law, I'm talking about this the venous line right here. They talking about the whole large volume of air going right into you. Chest pain. Shortness of breath. Coughing, cyanosis, which is blue purple color of skin, and the lips or the nail beds. 
visual disturbance, double vision, maybe even some blindness, confusion, restlessness, fear, slight paralysis of one side or the, or the body, coma, and last but not least, possible cardiac arrest. Now, when you, if you are a patient, wouldn't you want to know this? That you're at risk and you want to make sure that the people working on you don't do something that causes you to have an air embolism. So let's look at the treatment for air embolism. First, we want to clamp all bloodlines. We want to make sure all bloodlines are clamped. Then we want to put the patient on the left side with the head lower, which we call the Trendelenburg position, where the head is lower and the feet are up. But they're on their left side to trap the air. Then we want to attempt to aspirate, meaning pull out the air with the syringe from the access if possible. Initiate CPR if needed. Notify the emergency medical system, 911, if condition warrants. Notify the physician. We want to monitor the signs closely and support blood pressure with saline per access after air is removed. We also want to administer oxygen. Then we want to prepare to transport the patient to the hospital as needed. And then after that, we document the incident. Interventions provided or treatment provided. And the patient's response. But you just want to make sure if you go to dialysis, is you, your parent, or your loved one, that you know what to look for with these complications. Like if they, you know, somebody come home and say they wasn't feeling well or something happened, and they had to send your loved one to the hospital. You know like, what happened? They, and all of a sudden, nobody knows what happened. All of a sudden, they just passed out. Something happened. Another problem is what they call a gyna. A gyna. And all that is is chest pains. You may experience, but you may not know what the cause. And it just may happen when you go to dialysis. But no one's telling you why? What's the possibility? Again, that's the reason for this type of broadcast. We we just need the people to come and listen. Just get what you can get. And if it doesn't apply, as they say, let it fly. But you're not going to get no other nurse, I guarantee you. No other nurse in dialysis unless... They challenge me after they hear me say this. It's going to come out and do these broadcasts like I'm doing them. Get the green screen and the microphone and have all their information over a 30, 30 year period of gathered information. Yeah, I got information from the 90s. Information that 
patients today weren't even probably born. The same information that applied yesterday applies today. You know, you got a little bit of technology. But you had air and blood back then. You got air and blood today. It, it's nothing changed. The machines, the technology got better. But the treatment is the same. So let's look at angina or, or uh, chest pain which is a complication. What are the causes? Maybe a blood pressure, hypotension, low blood pressure. Maybe anemia, maybe your blood count. See, a lot of patients that's on dialysis have anemia. And so maybe because now your blood count is low, when you're on dialysis, not enough oxygen is going to your heart. Because your blood, I mean your hematocrit or your hemoglobin is already low. Now you got the blood coming out going through the machine. And just maybe, just maybe you're just not getting enough oxygen that's causing you to have these chronic chest pains just on dialysis. Maybe it's anxiety. Yes, anxiety can cause chest pains. Maybe you got cardiovascular disease. Had somebody on TikTok ask about clogged arteries. All that is possible. But if there's no one letting you know this, then you'd be sitting in the dark wondering, how did this happen? So at least, just at least, if you could just hear the information, and again, if it applies to you, take it and use it and try to apply it in your life. But if it don't, like I say, if it don't apply, let it fly. And so what are the signs and symptoms of angina or chest pain? It may be chest pain, or you may feel pressure around the chest. And if you feel that, let us know. Don't suffer in secret. Let the nurse know, hey, I feel like I'm having a little chest pain. Don't, don't get nervous. I can't tell you don't get nervous. I can't tell you that, but tell us so we can do what we need to do, like reduce the UF, the ultrafiltration, stop the pulling, give you oxygen, call a physician, administer medication per orders, and the medication would be nitro, nitroglycerin. Put it under your tongue. What that do, that dilates the vessels. So more blood can get to your heart. And then we're going to monitor your vital signs. I want to come back 15, 20 minutes and ask you, you still got the chest pains? They gone, Steve. All right, thanks. If the chest pains doesn't clear up, we're going to discontinue dialysis. You may need to go to the hospital and get further evaluation. Let's talk about another problem that has happened and in fact 
someone lost their life because of this problem. Yes, yeah, someone lost their life. And what I'm talking about, blood loss. Blood loss, that's a problem. And it can happen to you. You're like, Steve, what are you talking about? How can it happen? So look, again, with these bloodlines, okay, with these bloodlines, okay, they had a male and a female on the needle connection. So if, if, if the person is rushing to put you on and then they connect the lines and they don't twist the, the lower lock tight, this can, if you tug or move your arm or whatever, that can come and loose. And the next thing you know, you got blood all over the place. The pump is still spinning, and especially if it's the venous. This part is coming back to the patient. This disconnects, and now you got blood spewing on the floor. And this actually happened at a DeVita unit in Baltimore, and the patient lost their life. They had to cover over them. They had a catheter. They had the blanket over, and they went to sleep. The unit was short-staffed. Really, lady person was it being monitored in some way? The line connected, disconnected, and the blood pumping on the floor behind the chair. No one even knew about it. By the time they recognized the patient was in full blown cardiac arrest. So, yes. These pr problems happen. That's why you want to prevent it. Because if you know, like if you know there could be blood loss, now you can tell the technician, hey, can you make sure, like for the air embolism, when you go on, you can ask them, can you make sure my air detector's armed? Or can you make sure my line is clamped, my saline line is double clamped? It will make me feel safe. Because some of them just clamp it. They don't have the blue clamp on it. Or if you see the saline bag low, ask them, hey, can you change the bag? Because they may have to give you fluid and they give you fluid, they may not be paying attention, there may not be enough in there, and by the time they look, their air has gotten into the lines. Even with the, with the blood loss, you want to ask them, can you make sure my lines are, are tugged or tight? So it says blood loss. What are the causes? Arterial venous bloodline disconnection due to improper so who's going to connect it it says due to improper lure connection or loose connection the only person who has access to do that is either the nurse or technician then the next cause arterial venous needle slips out meaning dislodged from position if they don't got it taped down, you want to make sure you tell them to tape it down so you can feel comfortable that the needle is not going to come out. Because now you know it can come out. Dialyzer leak or rupture. You're like, what, Steve? Yes, the dialyzer can leak 
or it can rupture. Clotted blood and venous bloodline. That's how you can lose blood. As I've mentioned today, friend of mine training down in Louisiana. And, and the same thing happened to a patient she, she told me about today. Clotted bloodline, the venous bloodline, which is, this is the venous bloodline right here. And normally the clot forms right here in the chamber or up here. See a dark, like a real dark spot. Or you can have clotted blood in the arterial bloodline. So what are the signs and symptoms of blood loss? So you can know, so there don't be no hanky-panky where next thing you know something happened and they tear your bloodlines down. And you don't know what's going on. So here's some signs and symptoms of blood loss. Blood noted on the floor, chair, and on patient's clothing or blanket. Hypotension, which is low blood pressure. Air entering the dialysis lines. Venous pressure or arterial may alarm. The alarms may go to zero. Blood leak detector alarm. Foamy pink to red tinge dialysate in the hoses that's connected to the filter. If you see, like, um, uh, uh, pink, red tinge in the hoses that come from here, that means there's a dialyzer leak and blood crossed over the membrane, and that's not supposed to happen. Um, clots noted in the venous drip chamber. Arterial bloodline with air in it or line jumping. You're able to return the blood, unable to pump blood into the dialyzer. All these are signs and symptoms of blood loss. You're like, what, what happens if that happens, Steve? So you stop the blood pump, you clamp the blood lines, all right? We monitor the vital signs. We, so, we support the blood pressure as needed. All right, if it's a dislodged needle, we go ahead and, and, and put uh, stop the bleeding. Some places may restick depending on when it happened in treatment. Notify the doctor, they may draw uh, blood, obtain labs. We try to return as much blood as possible. And if it's a clotted lines, we change the lines and restart treatment. With a new blood uh, tubing and dialyzer. Then we document the incident. Another problem is cardiac arrest. And that the causes of that, electrolyte imbalance, especially high potassium, dysrhythmias, arrhythmias. I mean, so much large air embolism. Signs and symptoms of cardiac arrest is absence of the heartbeat or carotid pause. Lack of spontaneous respiration. Unresponsiveness. and fibrillation. Uh, so you wanna make sure that people at the dialysis center, if you experience 
a cardiac arrest, you want to make sure they know to activate the EMS. Start CPR. Return your blood. Maintain an open access. Notify your doctor and give you oxygen. You want to make sure the staff knows this. And most of the time they do. But you want to make sure these people are working in unison. So you can have a positive outcome if you experience a cardiac event. And, it, and it's the same as I talked about clotted uh, lines. The same applies to this, the clotted dialyzer. Yes, this is can happen too. If air get into here, or if they not giving you your blood thinner, or they pulling off like too much fluid, And a lot of times you know because you see this getting real dark and the venous pressure going up and the TMP is alarming. And if that happens, most of the time, depending on how far you are in your treatment, they're going to have to change the dialyzer. Now, the person, do they know how to do that? Do they know how to change a clotted dialyzer? This is where we talk about when you have staff that may go on the floor too early. And if you don't have senior staff around and you're working with a new crew and something like this happens, and if you could return some of the blood, but the person didn't know and end up throwing all your blood away. Unnecessarily. Just because they didn't know how to return the blood that they could. Happens all the time. That's why you want to know what's going on. Soon as that alarm goes off, you want to know what is that alarm for? Don't just leave it to chance. Remember, this is your treatment. Let me do a couple of more, and then I'm going to call it a night. A lot of people, another problem I notice, but a lot of patients don't understand, is... They get a headache. They get a headache, and it only happens during dialysis. It may be your loved one. It may be in yourself. You know, as soon as dialysis starts, maybe an hour in the treatment, head may start hurting. You may like, Steve, can you give me two Tylenol, please? And I go get the towel and all, bring back the water. I say, you okay? What's going on? Got a headache. So let's look at some of the causes. So you'll know as a dialysis patient, what may be causing your headaches when you may not understand or get the answers from anyone else. Not saying that this is the cause, but it could be a cause. And you may not realize or recognize it. So one of the causes is the fluid shift. Like, Steve, what do you mean the fluid shift? So look, when you're doing dialysis and you look at this filter, you got these hoses on the back, and on the machine we program how much fluid 
we're trying to pull off. Now, if you're trying to pull off three and a half liters, and if you want to get an idea of what three and a half liters is, just think of three of these bags. Because this is a liter. Three of these bags is three liters. And then a half a bag would be three and a half liters. Now, when you're trying to pull off this much fluid, three of these bags in a three to three and a half hour time frame, you're going to have all kind of uh, situations occurring at the cellular level. And I'm not going to get into it because it's not a science class. But when you start pulling off fluid like that from the blood, and then you're talking about removing waste, then that could cause you to have a headache. Some people may get it, some don't. Everyone is different. Then you got the dialysis uh, disequilibrium which means a slower transfer of urea occurs from the brain tissue to the blood. So fluid is drawn into brain cells causing swelling. Now this all happens at the cellular level. You can have high blood pressure. That because this causing a headache. Change in sodium level. Because you know you're dealing with electrolytes in the bath. Remember the bath? This is how dialysis say, look, this is just one portion. And you got the bicarbonate. <coughs> Excuse me. You got the bicarbonate. This is just the acid. And they got certain electrolytes in it. Sodium, potassium, magnesium, dextrose. You can also be anxious or nervous tension. And, when and that can come from just going to the dialysis, getting ready to undergo a treatment. Some people are still not used to that. After a year, two years. I know some people who take Xanax. That's why a lot of people, they go to Dallas, they ask for Benadryl. Yes, it's supposed to help for itching, but it also helps um, with, you know, with the anxiety and re relaxing you and person falling asleep in hopes of when they wake back up, it's time to go. Also, a possibility of decreased levels of caffeine. Say you're a smoker or you drink coffee. Or it could be over-the-counter drugs. Or we know if you use street drugs, yeah, it is dialysis patients that use street drugs. Let's be for real. Dialysis uh, has no name on it. Kidney disease has no name on it. I work with patients at one unit. They so bold, they got off the machine and go in the bathroom and smoke crack. Or put some uh, put some um, um, heroin in their catheter. So it's not just uh, one group of people; it affects all. Doesn't care what your zip code is. 
And so what are the signs and symptoms of a headache, which we all know, pain in the head or facial area? And what we're going to do about it is we're going to assess the cause, possibly give you some offer Tylenol. A lot of people say, no, I don't want Tylenol. I don't do nothing. And I can understand that. We're going to monitor the response if we give you Tylenol. I want to come back and see how you feel. If your pressure's high, we're going to offer uh, clonidine if we have it, which is a blood pressure medicine. And we'll talk about one more, and I'm going to call it a night. And that one is fever and or chills. That's a big problem in outpatient dialysis. Fever and or chills. Oh, my God. Thank you. Wow. Uh, and what are the causes of fevers and or chills? And, and again, you may not even know. You can have a catheter. Maybe one everything going good for a week, and then the weekend you ready to go out, and the next thing you know, you shivering. Like when did this? Like all of a sudden, I'm starting to shiver, and you in bed, and you got the covers on you. Like what the hell is going on? The whole week I was good, and now on Friday night I'm ready to go out, and I got these chills. Well, it could be a possibility that you have an infection of your access that no, no one told you about, what to look out for, how to recognize it. And be like, Steve, what, 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 what can cause that infection if I don't touch it? How can it just, how can it just get infected? Let me tell you. It could be, again, if you have fever and or chills, then if you got a catheter or even an access in your arm, that could be your source. Be like, how's that? Because the people who put you on could have a break in a septic technique. You're like, what the hell are these big words, a septic technique? What I mean is, they're not washing their hands. They're not changing the gloves. They may be touching your access or doing something with it with the same gloves they used on another patient. Or they touched the machine. Or basically they transferred germs from their hands with the gloves on to your access. Or you could be on a machine and this can happen. And what happened, maybe bacteria has contaminated the fluid that comes through here. Call it a pyrogenic reaction. So now, what's the signs and symptoms of this? Fever and chills. Temperature over 99. Redness, swelling, or drainage at the infection site. Could be the catheter, could be the arm. You may see some drainage. You may see some redness. Even swelling. Temperature increase after dialysis is initiated. As soon as they put you on, you're, you're, you start feeling sick. That can happen. Or the temperature increase after termination of dialysis. Another sign, you feel cold. Involuntary shaking or chills. Low blood pressure. 
And they say a power reaction with something that comes from the fluid. The power reaction usually starts within 45 to 75 minutes at the start of dialysis. So what is the treatment for all of this? We're going to notify the doctor. If you got drainage from your catheter, your access, we're going to draw a culture. We're going to give you antibiotics. If it's in the system, they're going to draw water cultures. So, no, this was a lot. <laughs> this was a lot in an hour. But, I mean, it's a lot of information. And I just want to let people, you know, know that it not, you know, this is something that normally doesn't happen all the time, but it happens. Let me read my comments from uh, Facebook. Hey, Margaret, how you doing? Margaret said, it is real. Absolutely. Margaret says, you're right. Mark, I want to know everything. Then, hey, Miss Alicia, Richard dies. That means they need more training. Yeah, absolutely. Does that mean they need more training? Is this in? Uh, uh, RN. They need to run. Yeah, they don't. They won't do that. I wish they would with the educational videos. I need all, hey, yeah, Miss Margaret, I know you go to outpatient. So that's something that you can definitely be aware of. Know how much heparin you get if you get any blood thinner. You know, and look over at your line and make sure there's no foam. What I mean by the line, meaning the venous chamber is going to be on the other side of the arterial. And that's the return blood. And you just look and see if there's any foam bubbling at the top or is it just blood just coming smooth down? You don't see any bubbles or foam. And make sure, like right here, this goes to the monitor line. Wait a minute. No, it's not this one. I'm sorry. That's the, for that. Wait a minute. Right here, this is another line that comes off of the venous chamber, uh, which is the uh, the monitoring line with the filter. And you just want to make sure that there's no fluid or blood in this line, especially this filter being wet, because it could impact how your venous pressure is being monitored which in turn can affect the TMP. So this line goes to the uh, this filter. You'll see it sticking out of the machine. It's the venous monitoring line. And it's supposed to be unclamped because it's monitoring your venous pressure. So with that being said, uh, there's a lot more uh, problems. I just went over a few uh, for the sake of time. I'll probably be back, I don't know, maybe sometime this week. This is a long week for me. <laughs> wow, this is going to be a long week of working for me. So with that being said, I want to thank you guys for watching on YouTube and Facebook. Again, I hope this added value to your life. Uh, Margaret says she takes an aspirin. Absolutely. Hey, you're welcome, Margaret. Thank you for your support and watching. But uh, yeah, guys, I hope this added value to your life. Again, there's many more problems. I just went over maybe about five or six. 
that are pretty much common in the clinic. So just watch what's going on. If you have any questions, reach out to me on my website. Uh, let me put that up there right quick. I got it. Um, on the ticker, if you have any questions, you can go to my website, send me a message. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. That being said, take care, guys. Stay safe. God bless and have a great evening. I'm out. Around, don't get caught in the mind fit The fuel to the fire, ain't nobody can stop it it's Trouble in my city, but you know I'm across it Got a 40 on my hip and I'm liable to spark it Throw down these hits, my click is indivisible I aim, you duck, I squeeze, now you invisible I'm not afraid of getting physical All these different chemicals are fogging up my visuals Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Yo, we notorious, we ain't no runners Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Yo, we some warriors, they ain't caught gunners Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Put on my strap, put on the beat, put on the map, put on my team Take out every motherfucker in between, know what I mean? Better myself, better my aim, better my rap, better my name Killing rappers on my hang, I'm about to chase for the fame Never thought I wouldn't have